Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel and today I'm going to answer another question that was asked of me this time on LinkedIn. It's a question in response to a comment I made regarding on what is the definition of a number. So let's begin. So uh, here was the original question that I posted, the original post actually, what does number mean? Well, and I wrote down several definitions here, one by Webster, one by the Wikipedia or the idiots who run Wikipedia, another one by the online dictionary, and finally my definition, which says a number is the measure of a size or a magnitude. A size and a magnitude or a quantity are all the same thing. A number describes the measure of a size or a magnitude, not approximately, not nearly, not accurately as desired, because that doesn't mean anything, but exactly, okay? So that is what is a number. It is the description of a size of, or a magnitude. And you may say, well, hmm, uh, how do you come to that bit of knowledge? Well, this is how I arrive at it. First of all, the, the idea of magnitude um, in Euclid, and there's a, lot, there's a lot I'm going to condense in this. Uh, I could speak for many hours on this topic, but let me just first of all tell you that Euclid distinguished very clearly between an, a magnitude and a number. And you'll see in definition one here, it says a magnitude is part of another magnitude, the lesser of the greater when it measures the greater. Well, that's not exactly the translation. In the Greek here on the left, it says, meros esti meiethos, meiethus to elason tu misonas, misonos, excuse me, otan katametri to mison. Okay, so literally translated it means uh, a part or a size or a magnitude of a magnitude uh, of the minor elason is minor and by the way uh, ancient greek oh, there's so much i need to say here that i i kind of keep on going off on a tangent so it basically says that part of the magnitude um, uh, of of a magnitude which is the minor or the lesser part, the elason, elason means minor, of the major uh, when it measures the major or the bigger part. So it, basically what it says is a magnitude is, it's, this is a, a little bit circular because it says a, a, a magnitude is that which measures another magnitude. Okay, so it's really not well defined, but in my re revised Euclid's Elements, which has never been published, I define a magnitude correctly. A magnitude is only the concept or idea of size. It's a platonic concept, and I'm pretty sure the Greeks understood it that way, but Euclid was trying to write this down. And since Euclid didn't write it down correctly, it behooved me to write it correctly in my revised elements. A magnitude is just a concept. It's an idea. How big, how small, how tall, how heavy, uh, how wide, etc. Okay, so you get the message. So he defined a magnitude very clearly in book five. And he also defined a ratio. He says a ratio is a certain type of condition. That's also a bad definition. What a ratio is really is simply a comparison of two magnitudes, okay? You compare them. At first, you compare them qualitatively, and that's the first kind of measure. Now, to, to really learn more than you've learned in your entire life, and more than any academic who came before me, you need to go to my LinkedIn article called How We Got Numbers, okay? And read this and study it carefully. It will take you quite a few hours to understand it. And do watch the links because there is so much information there. This is worth more than any book that's ever been published on number. So I'd encourage you to go there. Okay, so now, after I published this question, a certain Mr. Paul Haddock asked me, made some comments and asked some questions. So his first comment here is, is good, because it says that uh, 
my definition depends on the fundamental physical considerations, but that's not strictly speaking true. It depends on the platonic considerations. Okay, and I describe <clears throat> all that in my uh, my refutation of the fact that there are no axioms or postulates in mathematics. So, really, what you need to do is watch this short. Begin watching these short videos here. The one, the first one is the straight line and extended line, how you can actually derive everything from nothing. In other words, you begin with a void universe, pitch darkness, all black, and you derive these concepts. And that shows you how to get the first, the line and extended line, then how to get the circle, then how to get right angles and everything else, uh, the last of the requirements. By the way, they're not axioms or postulates. They're etimata, which in Greek means claims or requirements. So just coming back to this thing here, the original translation, for example, ancient Greek is quite different to modern Greek. In modern Greek, that word there will be spelled differently. So if you try to look this up in Google Translate or some dictionary in Greek, you'd get something really strange, okay? You'd get something, let's go over here. You'd get something that doesn't really mean what it meant in the ancient Greek. So let's just take a look at that word. Based, let's say it's Greek. Okay, and now it says mellow, and <laughs> it doesn't really mean mellow in Euclid's elements, okay? It means minor. But now if you had to type minor in English, it will translate as anilikos, okay? Which means a minor in terms of age. But Greek is a polymorphic language, so there are several of these that will mean minor. For example, Anilikos and mikros, and mikros. Anilikos and mikros mean uh, minor in age. Okay, uh, but uh, and also, well, mikrotros is slightly different. But the words uh, uh, lason and asimantos, asimantos, <clears throat> are closer to the original Greek. Okay, so you'll see that it, in the modern Greek, it's spelled with an omega and omega, and in the ancient Greek with omicron and o, like this. There are two letters in the Greek language which make the same sound. Okay, so before I run out of time, let me answer, try to quickly answer these questions of Paul Haddock. So he says, I just realized implicit to your definition is an extreme skepticism regarding ir irrational numbers, which I imagine you will say are not numbers. That's quite correct, Paul. They're not numbers. They're actually magnitudes. And it is possible using, starting from scratch, to arrive at what you see in front of you here, which defines any multiplication and any division, okay? So you can move these points. And by the way, note, it is possible to construct a circle through any three given points, regardless of what they are. Now, provided this uh, length here is chosen as one, you can do all divisions and all multiplications of any magnitude you like. Now, where algebra becomes different is when you try to give these magnitudes here names. So let's just put the grid. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to put the grid in. Okay, so let's just put that over there and that over there. Okay, so if what, what you can say here or conclude here is that 3 times 4 is 12, right? And it doesn't matter if you do 3 times 3, that'll be 9. And if you say 9 divided by 3, it'll be 3. Or, you know, uh, let's, let's make this smaller here. Let's make this, uh, let's try to make this 2 and that 4. So if we, if we do that, then 8 divided by 4 is 2, or 8 divided by 2 is 4. So all uh, division and multiplication is defined perfectly without numbers whatsoever in geometry, okay? Now, algebra attempts to do a measure of these in terms of names, okay? So we want, so we'll call this the unit, and then, of course, this is a multiple of the unit. And so if you had any one of these here, let's say you had 3.5, something, you try to get pi on that side, you try to measure pi on there, then you'd never be able to give, uh, and you had one here, let's make that one, you'd never be able to give this line here a name, except as a magnitude. You call it pi, or, or if you want it square root 2, 
it would have a magnitude, but it's never, ever uh, described by a measure. You cannot measure pi. Not even God can measure pi. There is no way to measure these magnitudes. So while pi and square root 2 are very well-formed concepts, they have no measure, therefore we cannot call them numbers because there are no numbers describing their measure. Okay? So uh, then he says... Um, I've always imagined that perhaps irrational numbers have led to mathematics and science permanently prone to certain types of head scratching. <laughs> you, you're kidding, of course, because perhaps our reality is fundamentally discrete rather than continuous. No, that's not true. Uh, as I said, in the perfect, uh, in the perfect, uh, in the realm of perfect concepts, everything is possible. You can actually multiply magnitudes and divide them, but when you try to measure, it's not always possible to measure those uh, those particular magnitudes and a number is a measure of a magnitude so Paul Haddock has a very good idea of what is a number now, I'm running out of time sooner or later on this uh, recorder here is going to stop so I'll have to finish off what I recommend is you read my article and you go to my YouTube and especially watch these videos here because in here I, I prove to you that you can derive the requirements of Euclid, which are the first five, if you look at book one and you come down here to the definitions, there are these first five requirements, which are incorrectly called axioms or postulates. They're etimata, not postulates, okay? Uh, and this word here, itisto, I don't believe any uh, Greek knows exactly what it means, but it doesn't mean to postulate or let it be postulate, as was translated by Sir Thomas Heath. Anyway, I think I've gone a little... Uh, but uh, over time, so, <laughs> and I didn't really mean to go this far. I hope I've answered your question. If there's any other question you need for me to answer, feel free to post it on here and I'll try to answer it. So, my name is John Gabriel, and this is a new calculus channel. Till next time, goodbye.